Good. To start the listening supportive factor session, we will once again say Sandhu and salute the blessed one. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Honor to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Honor to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Honor to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. There are, O oh monks, these three feelings. Pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant feelings. A disciple of the Buddha, mindful, clearly comprehending, with his mind collected, he knows the feeling and their origin, knows whereby they cease, and knows the path that to the ending of the feelings lead. And when the end of feelings has reached, such a monk, his thirsting quenched at a ends nibban. Dear old friends, today is the second day of this Brisbane and Zach Long holiday mindfulness workshop. In this workshop, we yesterday discussed how special this group of people is. If I may a little more elaborate on that, once the Blessed One has mentioned in one of his discourses that when in the divine realm, a divine being is about to expire, other divine beings tell him, it seems, go to the divine realm and acquire the most rare and difficult thing and get that get the complete access to that rare thing. So this is a bit confusing because when someone is expiring in the divine realm, other divine beings are telling us. So when we are in the divine now, in, in, in human realm, we think there's a divine realm and we should go there and that is the best place. But whereas um, Buddha says, for the divine beings, Human realm is the divine being, uh, divine realm. And uh, what is to acquire here the most rare and difficult thing is the faith in Buddha's teaching. And not only that, then the advice to that divine being about to expire is to get the complete access to it and um, bring, come to a situation where you will never go back on that teaching, which means at least attain the first stage of the sainthood, which we call so on or um, stream winner or stream enter. So, if you consider this that particular discourse, all you have come from the divine realm to this divine realm to get that access, to get that complete access. So that is what you are doing here. So don't in any way underestimate the sacrifice that you have done in this um, long holiday. So we started that yesterday. And uh, um, we have taken a particular discourse, the discourse called Samadhi discourse. In that Samadhi discourse, the Blessed One is giving a very powerful message that there are three types of feelings. And if you uh, are mindful and clearly comprehending on these three types of feelings, then you will finally um, achieve Nibbana, which is the ultimate realization. And in that discourse, we have uh, started a beginning or uh, given a basic introduction to it. And yesterday, we just understood the meaning of um, 
vedana or meaning of feelings. And if I may recollect it, the feeling is the mental input to the physical manifestations of the basic elements. And that is the gateway to the mind. And then we discuss a little bit about the, about the three types of feeling. And then of um, Vedana or significance of feelings in the continuing existence or the dependent origination. And there, the feeling is playing a main role, huge role to decide whether you will continue the dependent origination by generating by giving rise, by letting it to have craving or depreciation of craving, right? So for that, um, there are three main uh, stages of our existence or of the dependent origination uh, has been tackled by Buddha. The three main uh, steps are the contact and feelings, and the craving. The contact is leading to feeling. The feeling is leading to the craving. Contact means the combination of three elements, which is internal sense faculty or internal faculties and the external sense object and uh, generation of the consciousness. Knowing that these two are now um, connected, what to internal and external uh, objects are connected. Internal sense faculty is connected with the external object. So when these three are together, we call it contact. So blessed one is using the same thing, um, same contact to understand feelings and then instead of generating craving towards it, to go backwards or at least know the feeling. And then by knowing the feeling, he is creating a situation to stop craving or depreciate craving. So we discussed that a little bit in um, our initial introduction yesterday. Today, we are going to go a bit further, We're going to discuss uh, about especially so-called pleasant and painful feelings to reach Nibbana. So that is what this particular discourse, Samadhi discourse says. <clears throat> To, <coughs> excuse me. Um, to reach Nibbana, if we will have to go through present and painful feelings, um, we will have to make use of another discourse that the recent one has introduced to the world. And for me, I'm considering that as the Bible of mindfulness. This particular workshop is a mindfulness workshop. In the mindfulness workshop, we should be using the tools there to explain um, <coughs> uh, anything that we are explaining here. So um, in that discourse, uh, the discourse on four foundations of mindfulness, Blessed One is saying, uh, um, if there is any worldly feeling, worldly pleasant feeling, worldly painful feeling, worldly um, neither painful nor pleasant feeling, just be aware of it. Similarly, he is introducing another idea when uh, in this particular discourse, Samadhi discourse, blessed one is saying only pleasant, painful, and neither pleasant no painful feeling. But in the four foundations of mindfulness, 
um, Blessed One is saying, giving two branches or two classification, two sections for these three. One is worldly section and the other is the spiritual section. In the spiritual section, also Blessed One is saying, even when you come to spirituality, it is not just one uh, silver plate. It is not the red carpet right through. Even there, you have pleasant feelings, of course, and you have painful feelings as well, even in the spiritual life. And even in the spiritual life, you have neither painful nor pleasant feeling. So, therefore, uh, painful, pleasant, and then the, the neutral feelings, if I may call, the third one, uh, are common to our day-to-day -day existence, which is worldly existence, as well as to the spiritual existence. So I, I would like, therefore, to um, make a comparison of the two, in um, irrespective of what category it is, the Blessed One's advice is not to stop one and come to the other. His advice is, whatever it is, you just be aware of. So that's the only thing he says in mindfulness. Mindfulness means you just know it. Knowing that I am here and now. That's all what you will have to do. You, you are not trying to get rid of all your worldly things and come only to spiritual. No. He says, if you are having a worldly painful feeling, be aware of it. If you have worldly uh, pleasant feelings, be aware of it. And if, well, if you have if you have any opportunity to be aware of neither pleasant nor no unpleasant, just be aware of it. Similarly, the spiritual uh, world as well. So if you make this comparison of uh, worldly and spiritual feeling, worldly feelings are mm, mainly based on sensuality. Satisfy, satisfying your sense faculties is the worldly. Um, it may be happiness coming from the sensuality. And for the same reason, even the pain is coming from the sensuality. Right? So um, if you um, become spiritual, you can, um, you can stop being uh, so much sen satisfying sensuality you can get, go to the first, take the first step of spirituality, which is um, generosity, giving. So if you give, uh, instead of satisfying only your sense of words, or sense faculties and your near and dear ones, uh, you use those things to give to somebody else whom you are not related to, then that becomes generosity. And that uh, is spirituality, or that is spiritual feeling. Maybe happiness, or if there is any uh, any uh, pain that you will have to undergo. Suppose, especially if you are offering food. Now we have had food uh, uh, today, and food was donated by some donors. So, in donors giving those food, although they are not practicing but they have come out of their sensual world and helped us. So um, they are happy to give food to us. And at the same time, they had to undergo a lot of difficulties, prepare a menu and buy things and spend their money and spend their time and um, take time in cooking and things like that. So that's pain in the spiritual uh, generosity compared to sensuality. But this is not the spirituality the blessed one is talking about. And uh, if you go a bit further on generosity, giving, uh, you may um, decide rather than giving, I should also um, at the same time um, observe my five precepts or eight precepts for lay person. Right, so you become more virtuous. So when you become virtuous, generosity, generosity comparatively is a worldly thing. 
So uh, virtuous is superior to being generous. So even uh, to become virtuous, um, being virtuous is giving you happiness because you don't harm anybody. You take fear uh, of other people that may be generated by you. Since you don't kill the animals, are not afraid of you. And since you don't steal and don't engage in uh, um, sexual misconduct, so people are not afraid of you because you don't do any such um, unacceptable thing. So it becomes more spiritual compared to generosity and generosity becomes the world. And uh, if you go a bit further, rather than just being generous, uh, or rather virtuous. Um, I should uh, start meditating or practicing mindfulness. When we talk about practicing mindfulness, according to Buddha, that is uh, the highest spirituality and being virtuous become comparatively uh, worldly thing. Because a lot of people, even before Buddha was born, People, there were people who were very virtuous, and even today there are people who are very virtuous, but none of them practice mindfulness. So, being mm, trying to practice mindfulness is the highest spirituality. So, that is what we are talking about here yeah, as the spiritual um, basis for spiritual feelings, right? And in this comparison of worldly and spiritual feelings, uh, to satisfy worldly things, if I may go back again, the sensual, um, sensual world, you will have to work very hard, right? So of course you have some satisfaction, but you will have to work very hard and then achieve these things. But uh, in the highest spiritual, practice, which is mindfulness, there is nothing for you to work hard. You will just become an observer. No effort is needed. There is no need to burn yourself in doing it. Right? So it's an effortless thing, but very few people are coming to it. People like burning themselves rather than having this effortless, cool stuff. And therefore, the worldly pain or pleasure is based on sense faculties. Whereas when it comes to mindfulness, we usually close our eyes and go to a quiet place. So in other words, we try to come out of sense, sense faculties. So um, sense faculties doesn't play a big role there. And in the worldly happiness, or unhappiness is based on sense objects, what you see, what you hear, what you taste, etc. But whereas in the spiritual world, you see other way around, uh, we don't require sense objects. As I said, we go to a forest or we go to an empty hut like this. So sensual objects are not playing a big role. And because a worldly uh, pleasure and pain is mainly based on sense faculties and objects. There is a huge competition because we don't have as many sense objects as possible. To get those sense objects, everyone will have to fight. Everyone will have to hit behind. Everyone will have to cut the throat of the other. So it's a rat race without competition. You can't access this so-called limited resources. So whereas uh, spiritual realm is concerned, spiritual faculty is concerned, spiritual uh, feelings are concerned, spirituality is an absolute victory. There is no one is fighting, no one is telling you, you know, you get out of here and I want to sit here and I want to practice here. No. And even if you ask people, people won't come. But there is, there is no competition to come to a retreat, but of course there are some places where uh, if you have only 50 places, we say, sorry, you will have to be waitlisted. But other than that, um, practicing mindfulness, you can practice. It is not necessary to come to a retreat to practice mindfulness. You can do 
do it 24-7 even at home and in whatever posture. So therefore, there is no competition. So it's an absolute victory. So in the worldly feelings, since there is so much of competition, you will have to some sometimes have fights, quarrels, shoutings, raise your voice, and sometimes, and as we see today's world, even the wars are fought because of um, the worldly pressure and worldly um, feelings. And once Venerable Dalai Lama has said, today there is no value for human life. The value is for things, not for life. So therefore, to get things, that is sense objects, you are going to the extent of destroying another living being, another group of living being, another society of living being, and another country of living being. And it is going to the extent we kill the beings here and try to, fi try to find the beings outside this world as well. In, instead of looking after the beings here, we kill the beings and go and look for the beings outside. We are looking for beings outside, not because we love them, not because we want to have a good relationship with them, but we want to destroy them and get their resources as well. So that is how this worldly feelings is governing us. Whereas spiritual feeling, there is no absolutely a fight. Um, on the other hand, you are a bit lonely, lazy, and sometimes you feel sleepy in the spiritual feelings. So uh, it's completely the opposite to the race, competition, and the fighting. And the worldly feelings, you think it is very pleasant for you, but it may be unpleasant for others. If you especially go for this fighting and things like that and do a lot of unjustifiable things, it may be unpleasant for others. You may be giving thousand and one reasons to justify what you do, but it's not universally accepted. So therefore, in worldly feelings, um, it is not for you as well as others. But where a spiritual feeling is concerned, it is pleasant for you and pleasant for others as well, because you don't, don't do anything, you just uh, close your eyes and sit. And when someone sees you, and that person may be also feeling very calm and peaceful, um, because you are peaceful and you are generating that vibration. So that is um, how uh, spiritual feelings may affect the universe, the, the, the society, the one around you. So therefore, Pante Dhammaji says, at home, if one person is meditating, if the vibration will be sufficient for the others to come to the party, right? So another aspect of worldly feelings is, worldly feelings um, just vanishes. It happens only in that thought moment, only in that fraction of a second um, that is here and now. But whereas spiritual feeling is concerned, once you gain it, it is timeless. You have it now and even you have it for the future. It won't leave you. And moreover, it, keep improve, it keeps improving. And you start are thriving on that uh, spiritual uh, uh, feelings. And for the worldly feelings, uh, since there is a competition, since the resources are limited, things are decided by the economic theories, such as demand and supply, and you know, the inflation and all those things uh, um, will apply. But whereas uh, whereas uh, spiritual feelings are concerned, none of those stupid theories are applicable. Because you don't fight for things. You are happy with whatever that you receive on the plate this afternoon. But if you go to a restaurant 
will give you a list which we call menu and you will have to select yeah you don't have anything else of course if there is something that they are selling that you don't like you can refuse it uh, and there's something you don't like you can refuse it and so, something you like you can take more other than that there is no huge selection so therefore economic theories don't apply in the spiritual feeling especially when it comes to mindfulness economic theories are completely out of right so therefore world since things are decided by demand and supply in the sensual world in the worldly feeling you have to pay a price yes. can't get anything without paying but whereas spiritual feeling there is no one to charge there is no cost there is no money involved so therefore it is just free of charge and um, in the worldly feeling since the price is involved the money is involved as soon as the money is involved stress panic tension jealousy fight are uh, just following uh money so because of money um you you when you have money you don't just um, you don't just have wealth. you have a wealth of stress stress you have a wealth of panic attacks a wealth of tension that is what you call wealth and you can very clearly see that in sri lanka today and those who have robbed the country they have so much of money but they are in a huge stress and cursing themselves 24/7 so what's the point in having that stolen uh, treasure they won't be able to live peacefully but whereas the subjects in the country are concerned they are also affected um they are affected without treasure without without resources right so um either way when you talk about worldly feelings having it and not having it is both giving you uh, end of the day painful feelings rather than uh, pleasant feelings but in the spiritual world it's always peaceful it's always calm not only to you but around you as well and therefore um whoever who is having um, want to have worldly feelings they try to be with more people when you with, with when you with more people from morning to mm, evening until you go to the bed um your tension your stress your 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 panic situation to a certain extent forget so therefore they try to be very social they try to have party all the time meeting after meeting so therefore you can they can forget it but whereas when it comes to uh, spiritual feeling you try to stay as lonely as possible as secluded as possible so therefore others may say that you are anti social and if someone says that, consider that as a badge in your journey consider that as a victory in the journey because um, if others are feeling that you are anti social you are Mm, in a great way practicing mindfulness so we don't have certificates uh, the others are giving this anti social certificate just to say that you are to yourself and you are enjoying uh, your mind being with your body right so in worldly feelings the highest maximum pleasure that you can get is the sexual relationship whereas in spiritual world the highest um happiness is coming or start coming with celibacy you will start living a celibate life and it completely opposite what is in the world and spirituality is a bitter um fruit to the sensual world spirituality is a suffering the sensual world they will say 
what you get by practicing mindfulness. Can you go to a shop and buy something with mindfulness? That's how they talk. They hate it so much. But for the spiritual world, sensuality is a sign. They realize that so much uh, burning is there in the sensual world and they, they, they don't just um, imagine, they don't just um, make stories about it. Um, they are not daydreaming that the sensual world is suffering. Those who are in the spiritual world, most of them have enjoyed the sense of pleasure. And they have seen that the sense of pleasure is having no end. It's a bottomless bucket. So therefore, those who in the spiritual world has experienced sensuality is, end of the day, giving you suffering on. So this is why the Blessed One being a king realized after seeing a sick person, an old person, and dead person, this is what ultimately happens to all of us. That is, when he was enjoying the sensuality to the highest possible extent in those days. So therefore, those who are in the um, spiritual world, they have experienced that the sensuality is suffering. And in the worldly feelings, they try to make the worldly feelings as permanent as possible. It was so much of experiment, so much of um, research being done, so much of funds allocated to make this happiness continuing and make it permanent. But it never happens. They just keep wasting money. Whereas in the spirituality, you simply observe. The thing, only thing that you have got to observe is the continuing change. In other words, impermanence. So in the spiritual world, we get used to accepting impermanence. And in the worldly feelings, uh, if I may compare, if someone is not practicing spirituality, there is no difference between that, that human being and an animal. Because animals are also doing the same thing that the human beings are doing slightly in a so-called sophisticated manner. Animals eat, drink, sleep and produce their kind and live in fear. That's all what human beings are also doing. So therefore, um, hardly any difference between animals and human beings in the worldly feelings. But when it comes to spirituality, spirituality is only for those human beings having an advanced mind. So they say human, the difference between animals and human beings is having an advanced mind. Having an advanced mind means having the ability just to observe things, having the ability to be mindful is mm, the advanced mind. So if someone is not doing that, um, we have a big question whether we are real human beings or fake human beings. And in the worldly feelings, having um, the highest sense, of maximum moment of sense objects and the quickest way to satisfy your sense faculties is called the development. It's called rich. It's called educated. It's called all good. And in the spiritual world, if you don't do those things uh, from those standards, those who are in the spiritual world are considered, considered undeveloped or underdeveloped or poor and ignorant, and they don't know anything, and they just destroy things. This, they just waste their beautiful life according to the standards of the worldly feelings. And according to the standards of the spiritual feelings,
those who enjoy worldly worldly feelings are wasting their time so um, the bottom line in this comparison is that the spirituality is superior to the sensual field so um, how does this spirituality um, leads to ultimate realization if we um, if we take that if the spiritual feelings is so uh, superior and we will have to see uh, what those superior spiritual feeling is if someone comes out of their sensual world and spend a few hours here and how they reach the spiritual happiness how they reach what are the spiritual uh, pain that they uh, have and how they are leading to um, ultimate realization which we call nibbana so we will um, that is what i am trying to focus today because uh, talking more about worldly feelings is not necessary because that um, all of you are aware that is why you are here so according to the four foundations of mindfulness um the blessed one says when experiencing a pleasant spiritual feelings he knows i experience a pleasant spiritual feeling when experiencing a painful spiritual feelings he knows i experience a painful spiritual feeling when experiencing a neither pleasant nor painful feeling um he knows i experience neither pleasant nor painful spiritual feelings so i'm not we are not discussing the last one today we are discussing uh, the pleasant feelings pleasant spiritual spiritual feelings and painful spiritual feeling so um if you consider the practice for example um you are using this long holiday and attending this retreat in the retreat what do you do is walking and sitting we do few minutes of walking we do few minutes of sitting and that is developing your spiritual um feelings that is developing your spiritual pleasant feeling painful feelings and when i say that if i remind you once again how this happens this happens uh, by touching the the stage that we discussed yesterday um in the dependent origination the stage we discussed yesterday in the dependent origination is the contact blessed one is using this contact what is con meeting of the internal faculty with the external faculty and knowing that it has happened or we call it in technical terms uh, internal senses external sense objects and the connection of the two happens through the consciousness so when these three are together we call and using the contact while walking you may have your attention to the sole of the feet and you touch the ground or the surface on which you walk so this contact happens similarly when you do your sitting you take your attention maybe to the body in general so you may feel uh, the sensations the body is having or if you are observing your breath you may observe that in the tummy or in your chest or at the entrance of the nostril so wherever it is um you have your attention which is your body and the external object is the air that is coming in and uh, you know that these two things are connected or two things are um meeting and that is consciousness so in this manner either in walking or in sitting 
what we bring our attention is to contact, which we highly call passa. So um, this contact, when you have your attention to the contact, what we discussed yesterday was you start seeing uh, when you do for some time, you start seeing the basic elements, the characteristics of the heaviness, lightness, and uh, uh, grossness, softness, um, roughness, softness, etc. And um, or heat and cold, or maybe um, flowy nature, cohesiveness. So if you if you see these things, they are the uh, ultimate physical analysis analysis of the physicality. So when you see this final analysis of the physicality or the characteristics of the basic elements, then your mind may like it or not like it. When you feel very soft, you start having it continuously. But if you feel very, um, very um, heavy, then you may not like it. If you feel that um, you are being um, you, if you feel very very uh, throbbing like, then you so like that for whatever physical manifestation of the sensation of the basic elements, you will have some input, and that input uh, is. So these feelings, um, over time, when you keep on practicing, um, leads to gradually coming out of the sensual world. And you may be able to bring your complete attention to whatever practice you are doing. And to do that, since when you start uh, at the beginning, the teachers will tell if you can't bring your attention to the walking, if you can't bring your attention to the sitting, then the guidance of the teachers will be um, since you have more disturbances, since uh, your attention is going more to other things than to your sole of the feet or to your breath, or to the tummy, or to the entrance of the nostril, our teachers will use a technique of labeling. They will ask you to observe um, as well as drive your mind through labeling to what you are doing. So when you're walking, you may label your walking to start with as uh, right and left. When you are moving your right foot, you may say right, 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 right. And when you move your left foot, you may say left, 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 left. Or if you advance, if you are able to do that, you may be asked to label and lifting and and then you, instead of saying right and left, you will be labeling, lifting, 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 placing, placing, placing. And when you do that, your attention gets more and more close to your body. And then again, you may complain that no, my attention is going out again. And my attention goes to the things that I see, my attention goes to things I hear, and I start uh, daydreaming and all that. Then the teachers will say, uh, increase your labeling by adding another layer for your labeling. So not only just lifting and placing, they will say lifting, moving and placing. So you will, while lifting, you will say lifting, 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 while moving, you will say moving, 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 while placing, you will say placing, placing, placing. So in this manner, <coughs> you bring your complete attention out of the other things, other disturbances that you may have to exactly what you are doing. So your mind will uh, settle with the walking. 
And similarly, while sitting, if you are disturbed with uh, many things that might happen around the area that you practice or within yourself, such as thoughts and pain, uh, you may not be able to bring your attention to your breath or to the body. So therefore, even there you use the same technique of when the breath, breath is happening naturally, you allow the natural breath to take place, takes place as it is. And then you label when it is happening. When breath is coming in, you say in, 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 in. And you will say when it is exhalation is happening, you will label very slowly uh, in your head. Out, 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 out. This is done exactly when it is happening naturally. You don't label out when it is in, you don't label in when it is out. So you allow the natural breathing process to. Uh, take place and then keep labeling and then observe it. So um, in either in walking or in sitting, when you do in this manner, what happens is your attention is with your lower body in the walking and upper body in the sitting. And that takes you completely away from uh, the disturbances and from the sensual world. And this generates a fair amount of um, release of stress, fair amount of um, relieving of tension. And you are conserving a lot of energy that you would have otherwise used to satisfy your eye, satisfy your ear, satisfy your nose, throat, body, mind, etc. Because these faculties are fighting to get your attention. Now you have completely come out of those things and simply observe. So therefore you're conserving a lot of energy. This conservation of energy, having this holiday in your mind, is a big relief to the mind. So you, you may feel a lot of raptures and feel bliss because of this um, new way of life that you have just experienced. That situation is called the first jhana or first absorption or first immersion in some sense. In English, there are so many um, translations for first jhana. So what they say is, in few sentences, they are saying what I just mentioned. And they say this way, it is when a mendicant, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unskillful qualities, enters and remains in the first absorption, which has applied and sustained thoughts and the rapture and place born of that seclusion while placing the mind and keeping it connected, right? So if I, uh, now what we will have to do is, when you come to the first absorption, now we are talking about feelings, of course, uh, uh, because you, as I explained, since you have conserved energy, since you, since your mental, um, relief is there, you feel rapturous. So that is undoubtedly present feeling. And the bliss that you feel is a present feeling. It has, it is born of seclusion. Right? So that is the pleasant feeling that you have in the first jhana or the first absorption. And what is the painful feeling that you have? To achieve this, and you have got to get yourself secluded from few things. So achieve, to achieve the first jhana, in the first jhana definition itself, it is explaining that you, the hardship that you have to undergo, the hardship that you are, uh, that you are undergoing is um, 
coming off the sensual pleasures they say secluded from sensual pleasures secluded sec getting secluded from sensual pleasures is not an easy thing you yourself know what sort of arrangements you had to do for such a long time to get these three days and for most of you you um, you don't do all the three days there are only 30 30 or 35 people doing all the three days we have about 50 people on the first day and 20 dropouts the reason is so there is so much of pressure from the sensual world and that pressure um is um is not easy so therefore coming out of the sensual pleasure to achieve first jhana is a huge fight within yourself that's a cost a spiritual painful feeling in the first absorption and also it says not only just that coming out of it it says secluded from unskillful qualities what do you mean sex, sex, secluded from unskillful full folly unskillful qualities we usually call them hindrances so as soon as you are secluded from sensual world sensual pleasures the hindrances are attacking the hindrances are the although you don't have the sensual pleasures now you have their negatives their their images in your head those shades <coughs> those shadows keep bothering you that is why you call i can't bring my attention to the leg i can't bring my attention to the breath i'm getting so much of thoughts what thought thoughts of what you have seen thoughts of what you have heard thoughts of what you have tasted of uh, the places you have visited thoughts of the people you have been with right so those shadows are coming like ghosts and um, try to overpower you um therefore you will have to fight with them as well but if there is one second that you are able to bring your attention to the breath just for one thought moment if you are able to 100% bring your attention to the moment of the right foot then you're completely secluded from sensual pressures as well as those shades which we call unskillful qualities and you have paid the price you have undergone the pain and the gain for that pain is the rapture in the bliss that is born out of it so uh therefore in the first absorption you have the pleasant feeling on one hand in the spiritual world and also the unpleasant feeling on the other hand in the spiritual world so um this cost benefit analysis if i if i may say in the first uh, absorption uh, is showing you um the frictionless part when your mind is ready to accept that being out of sensual world and unskillful unskillful um qualities is giving you more pleasure then the mind is getting used to or at least the spiritual faculties in the mind is getting used to Uh, observing and exploring more and more things that that are there so therefore when you when you keep on continuing your practice with labeling what happens is you observe now there are no sense pleasures there are no shadows of sense pleasures which we call unskillful quality but in the first absorption you had something called um applied and sustained thoughts applied thought means the labeling sustained thoughts means when you label whatever you feel when you label and when you experience it when you experience it there is some feeling so you that comes as a thought say for example when you place your leg on the surface you are feeling cold 
so you know that you are labeling exactly that this is the right foot and then um, when the right foot is placed you felt cold that's a feeling and that's a sustained thought because you have applied to bring bring your thought applied your thought to bring the attention to the right foot as a result of that you have the other thought right so you have this applied and sustained thoughts continuously by doing that on one hand you got rid of your sensual world as well as unskillful qualities and on the other hand you gained your rapture and the bliss and you are continuing that when you continue that after some time the mind is grumbling mind is suggesting that there is another friction now in the first absorption the friction that you have in the first absorption now means keep lab keeping labeling all the time saying right 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 left 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 in in and out 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 is is a hit right it's a pain in the neck so you may not like it so in other words the mind is having the habit of identifying efficient ways to keep it to keep the mind so therefore at some point if you are successfully only observing without labeling you observe your complete walking process and whatever sensation that you feel whatever that happens whatever that disturbances that come you keep observing it and similarly while sitting you don't label in in and out 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 but instead you see that it is happening without labeling your mind is now sharp enough now my, your mind is focused enough so when that happens your mind is more relieved as a result your rapture is more your bliss is more right and when you achieve that state then that is called the second absorption or the second jhana or the second immersion right the technical explanation for that so many technical uh, translations uh, if you look um, in the book in the internet but i have selected something that explains what is happening better and it says calming down of applied and sustained thought the bhikkhu or the mendicant achieves and remains in the second jhana so what happens there is um he is not saying completely stopping it is calming down you don't you don't do it as intensely as earlier it's gradually slowing the applied thoughts and sustained thoughts the bhikkhu achieves and remains the same dropping that is the second jhana not just dropping it and he says with internal tranquility when you drop it you don't panic yourself you don't lose your balance you gain more you with internal tranquility and one point net one pointedness born of seclusion and when you um, earlier you had five factors sustained thoughts applied thoughts and uh, and uh, rapture and the bliss with all these four you have the focus now you are dropping two still you don't you seclusion as well now you are secluded from sustain and apply for you are more strong now, right um and then it says with rapture and bliss born of this concept now the rapture and born is a uh, bliss of concentration of the new comes concentration new tranquil mind the new tranquil mind is the mind 
without applied and sustained knowledge. So here, if you see, again you have in this absorption painful feelings and the pleasant feeling. Painful feeling is calming down of applied and sustained. So it's not easy because you are used. As soon as you stop it, again, the thoughts will start bombarding and you may get distracted. So you, you will have to fight with it. And pain to achieve the second jhana, second absorption. And with internal tranquility and one-pointedness one born of seclusion is also not easy. Because since you are very new, drop or calming down of the applied and sustained thoughts, although you gain the tranquility, it is right. Doing the asking me to stop labeling, and when I stop labeling, my thoughts are coming, and then you start blaming the teacher. You you may sometimes change the teacher, you may change the technique and a lot of things will happen because you become very unsettled, right? But if you keep on continuing, that pain, that painful feelings of um, harming down of the applied and sustained thought generates on one hand a seclusion from something which is uh, friction, friction, uh, frictional now. If you continue your practice with discussion, with getting justifications and reasoning out and rationalization of what is happening, you really get used to it and you will see you have more rapture and more blissful situation born of this new concentration without applied and sustained thought. So that is how you identify, you know, the new, um, what do you, painful feelings and in the same as the spiritual painful and spiritual uh, pleasant feeling. And when you continue the practice in this manner, now you have got the hang of it and <laughs> then getting used to more efficient ways of living, more mind. It is now trying to identify now what is the next thing I can drop? What is the next thing more um, friction, giving more friction? So then uh, the mind identifies that the rapture is more frictional, friction. Uh, why the rapture is uh, a friction is because rapture is something that you feel in the body. Rapture, initial rapture, you feel that as, you know, um, the worms dancing on your face and then um, maybe ants crawling on your face and then ants crawling in your skin. and those are the initial stages of electric shocks like lightning in your head and in your body. And then it develops into, you know, you feel like, you know, the whole body is um, filled with ants or the worms. And you may feel a lot of, um, lot of uh, vibrations in the body. And, or you may feel that you are in in a huge bubble of water or in, or in a balloon filled with water. So all these are the, the, the examples of how you feel rapture. And uh, whatever stage it is, <laughs> this bodily feeling, the mind is identifying uh, is a bit of a disturbance to the bliss that the mind is experiencing now, right? Because this mind is more peaceful. And although mind is more and more peaceful, 
and the mind is born to have a fiction created by the mind itself. This feeling of rapture is something that is not that you actually, there are ants or worms on your body or on your skin, not that you are actually in a bubble of water. But this is something that is created by the mind to enjoy that the mind is having. So therefore, uh, you keep on observing that. The only thing that you can do is, as the suggest in the four foundations of mindfulness, when you have this situation, he's asking us only to observe them. So when you keep on observing um, the rupture, uh, initially you may like it because it is so peaceful, so um, enjoyable. And, but um, with the discussion, teachers will ask you to just observe that. Observe the big, whatever that is possible with those things. And that observation will gradually take you away your attachment to it. Right? So therefore, uh, when that uh, detachment is happening, gradually or, or you will, uh, your feeling of rapture may gradually reduce, right? And although uh, rapture feeling is reduced, the mind gets more and more stronger, right? So that situation called, that situation is called, the third jhana or third zone or the third uh, immersion, right? Um, the technical way uh, that it, the third jhana is explained is like this. Uh, it says, having been detached from the rapture, so you gradually keep observing means you get detached dwells in equanimity. When you detach from what you have earned, rapture is something that you have earned, that you have really been enjoying. And when you detach from that, you don't, you don't like it. So you will start hitting or you will start crying or you will start suffering. Instead, it says that we could dwells in equanimity. Well, very well balanced. How? With mindfulness and clear comprehension. Because you are observing, you just observe the changing nature. Observation means just make a note of it. Don't interpret on it. Don't comment on it. You not something you see. That is all not just mind, but mindful language. You let things happen as it is and accept things as it is. So because of this clear comprehension um, and experience this bliss in mind, he feels is settling down and calming down, your bliss body as well. And then it further goes and says, he achieves and remains in the third jhana, third absorption, equanimous and mindful of the bliss he abides in. Now his mindfulness is so strong, um, it simply observes things that are going on. Now he's in this bliss in the mind and the body, and he is aware of it as well. And he is equanimous about it. Means not like and doesn't hate either. That is equanimity. So this equanimity or the equanimous situation is not something that I'm going to talk today. It is the talk for tomorrow.
tomorrow's session. I hope this talk has given you a good comparison between worldly feelings and the spiritual feeling. How the spiritual feelings, uh, spiritual painful and um, pleasant feelings are identified, how each absorption is uh, improved by getting the mind secluded from the more frictional, uh, more friction that um, the absorptions themselves are having. So uh, may this therefore talk, this talk, empower you to forget. Blessings of the Noble Triple Gem. Thank you for listening.